it's as good as it gets. It's maybe a bit daunting as you take your place on the starting line. Your dreams are about to clash with reality. It's an exciting race. It's got the history, and it's just a real exciting race. It's the fastest 26 miles you'll ever run in your life. Keep the hold it up as, as the, the yardstick that can measure every other race by. Each year, thousands of athletes gather in Hopkinton Town Common. The high school is used as the athlete's village in the hours before the start. To offer a bit of perspective, four-time Boston Marathon winner Bill Rogers, affectionately known as Boston Billy. Hopkinton is the epitome of small-town America. You know, it's a perfect place, I think, to start the world's greatest marathon. The Boston Athletic Association has done a terrific job putting the Boston Marathon on for over 100 years. They're the best marathon organization in the world. Working together, they produce the best marathon. In total, there are four starts to the Boston Marathon. The wheelchair athletes take off at 9.17. The elite women begin at 9.32. And the elite men and the top 10,000 seated runners go off at 10 o'clock. At this moment, don't let your fears hold you back from your dreams. Your odyssey has begun. Olympian Ryan Hall has run the fastest time ever by an American on the Boston Marathon course. They don't want to not take in all the energy that's surrounding the start, but at the same time you have to use your head to run those first 20 miles. A famous example of the risks of the first miles was the dangerous 1987 wheelchair crash. Here to talk about the strategy for the wheelchair competition is Gene Driscoll. The downhill out of Hopkinton is one of the most tenuous points in the Boston Marathon course for the wheelchair division. The chairs are all packed tightly together, there's a pace vehicle in front of us. Once the pace truck leaves, there's an uphill. Whoever gets to the top can get away. For an important reminder about pacing, here's Jack Fultz, the winner of the 1976 Boston Marathon. First mile is steep downhill, and a lot of people will be in your way slowing you down. They're actually doing you a favor by keeping you from going too fast. It's every man's Olympic dream. It's something that every one of us can achieve, whether we're running with a qualifier or we're running for a greater cause, a nonprofit. And it's just the most amazing feeling just to be part of the experience. As you run through Ashland, the course winds downhill along Union Street for just over three miles. Ashland was the original start of the Boston Marathon. In choosing that route, BAA officials were determined to emulate the 1896 Greek Olympic course topography. That meant a relatively flat course leading up to the Newton Hills late in the race, and then a downhill run into Boston. According to Michael Conley, author of 26 Miles to Boston, the course takes on a life of its own. The one thing people have to understand is that for 364 days of the year, it's just 26 miles and 385 yards of curves and street. It's on that one day that the course is personified as a beast that comes up and sometimes grabs the competitor. The competitor thinks they're racing against others, but they're unaware of the fact that the course is taking body blows at them and they will pay the price when they come to mile 20, when it becomes really the second half of the race. Dave McGilvery, race director for the Boston Marathon, ran across the United States in 1978. He has run the Boston Marathon each year since 1971, and he knows every nuance of the course. As you're working your way through Ashland and heading towards Cunningham, the roads are still fairly narrow between 25 and 30 feet, so you're still pretty much sandwiched in with all the runners that you started with. But once you begin to enter Cunningham, the course opens up, you have full breadth of the roadway, and here's where you can start to stretch it out and get that pace going. Framingham, a lot of roads perpendicular 
to the course, come into play where spectators can now access the course, whereas in Ashland and Framingham, um, that was not the case. You're just seeing residential people out on the course. This is also a good time to check in with how you're handling the weather conditions. If it's windy or rainy or hot and humid, you're going to have to make adjustments. As you approach the 10K point, because this is a standard distance that you're normally used to running, a 10 kilometer road race, you're really able to get a good sense for the pace you're on at that time. If you know that when you get there, you're running at a pace as fast as, if not faster than your 10K PR, then you, you know you may have gone out too fast. Rip the number off her sweatshirt. He was unaware of the fact that Tom Miller, Daffy Switz's boyfriend, was a discus thrower and running with her. <laughs> Tom knocked Jock Semple to the ground, and the cameraman captured the picture, and the picture ended up on the front page of newspapers throughout the world. gentle downhill slope until the 10 mile mark, where it levels out heading through Natick Center. The wheelchair athletes take advantage of the flat stretches of the race to draft off each other to conserve energy. Well, Bob did it in two hours and 58 minutes. He opened the door for all the wheelchair athletes to come after him, myself included. And the Hoyts are an important part of the Boston Marathon. They symbolize strength, ability, and not accepting limitations. see two steeples in the sky. One is a Protestant steeple and one is a Catholic steeple, and they're both drawing you to the native common. As you're approaching the 10 mile point in the Boston Marathon, the mathematics of the race itself comes into play, because once you approach 10, you're still counting up and you know you only have three left until you get to the halfway point. Once you hit the halfway point, you start counting down and that mentally and emotionally is a huge lift that once you hit the halfway point, you run further than you have left to go. Since the first Boston Marathon in 1897, the women of Wellesley College have encouraged and inspired decades of runners with their legendary wall of sound. When you're approaching Wellesley College, um, you hear this roar prior to getting there. And you, you hear everyone talking about Wellesley College, Wellesley College. Women are screaming your name. You feel like you're a rock star. 
I had uh, my name written across my shirt and just hearing hundreds of women yelling your name was just an incredible feeling. It is overwhelming and I, I say for myself that that's the only moment in the race when I cried. It gets me psyched up every year and it couldn't come at a better spot. You have the hills awaiting you and you need this extra energy that they're going to give to you. So soak it all in in Wellesley for the hardest is yet to come. I love crossing over the halfway mark because you know that you have less amount of road to run than you have already run. You know that you can get this done. fastest downhill on the marathon course for the wheelchair division is about 15 and a half miles into the race, or 25 kilometers. I've gone uh, about 38 miles an hour. Other competitors have gone in excess of 40 miles an hour. It can be really bumpy, so it's important that you keep your center of gravity low so that you can maintain control of your chair. there's a big downhill and uh, the temptation there is just go flying down this downhill but right on the other side of that downhill it's a bit of a valley and you climb back up and one of the first hills that really hits you that comes before and even that a lot of people don't even think about right after the 16 mile point it's almost like an optical illusion there's a lot of people there and you don't really see it but you can really feel it just past the newton wellesley hospital you'll see the woodland mbta station on the right over the years some runners have chosen to drop out here before going on to the famed hills of newton Until the 17 mile point, we really haven't made any 90 degree turns in the course. In Boston being one of the only races that has only five turns in the entire race, you come upon your first one at the Newton Fire Station at 17 and a half miles. The first hill is not that long, and what you're going to find is that when you get to the top, you get a nice break of about a mile or so between the hills. And what I like to do when I'm running is not exactly expend all my energy on the hill, but save a little bit so that I can crest the hill really hard. You crest that hill at Brayburn, and the course starts to flatten out a little bit. You have to know there's a third hill and a fourth hill approaching. You crest the third hill, and that flattens out for a bit as you go by Newton City Hall. Then comes the infamous heartbreak hill. And once you crest that, it's downhill the rest of the way. When you approach any one of these hills on Commonwealth Valley, just allow your body to be loose. Don't try to beat the hill or it will beat you.
Tarzan, alerted, got very competitive, moved into the lead, won the race, and broke Johnny's heart. Jerry Nason from the Boston Globe, a long time sports writer, wrote how uh, Johnny had a broken heart, his heart was broken that day, heart went killed. I actually trained on the hills, and I think if you can keep your pace, and keep focused, and know that when you get to the top of the hill, you are pretty much into Boston, you can do it. A lot of us have only done 20 miles in our training runs, and once you get to mile 20, you have to just accept the fact that you are going to need the energy of the people around you to get through those final miles. Nothing can prepare you for the feeling once you've crested the hill. As I got to the top of the hill, I finally realized I was home free. I wouldn't finish this marathon. For many of the runners, this is a bad patch. You just come through the Newton Hills, you crested heartbreak, and now you have five miles of downhill to run. And you want to make sure you really gather yourself, recompose, and get ready for the downhill section that you want to take advantage of. One of my favorite parts of the course is when you come down off of that hill and you have Boston College students on both your right and your left. There is an amazing amount of energy there. The students are phenomenal. After the runners crest the top of Heartbreak Hill, they must now go down the back side of Heartbreak Hill. That's where they'll pass a cemetery, and they'll soon understand why more leads have been lost in that mile than any other mile in the entire race. It's called the Haunted Mile. The crowd's huge, you know? They're, they're really into the race and everything here. But after 20 miles, 22 miles, you are just whipped. Past the 22-mile point, marathoners descend Chestnut Hill Avenue and take a left onto Beacon Street. Going down the hill into Cleveland Circle can be very fast and, and tricky. You want to maintain as much of your speed going into the left-hand turn, uh, but you also need to be careful of the trolley tracks that you need to cross. to Cleveland Circle, your calves will be killing you, your quads, your hamstrings, pretty much your entire body will be killing you, but the good news is, is that you are about to enter Coolidge Corner and get into the heart of Boston. The toughest part about running along Beacon Street in Brookline, around the 23 mile mark, is that you can start to see the landscape of the city of Boston. The Sitco sign is right around the corner, and you think you're almost there, but you have to realize you still have a long way to go. You know, there is a saying among experienced marathoners that anyone can run 20 miles, but these last six miles are the real challenge and from mile 22, 23, 24, as you're going through the town of Brookline, it gets really tough and everyone sort of struggles mentally. But the Boston Marathon fans are on your side so much. They will help you. Halfway down Beacon Street, you still have a few miles to go. You're rolling downhill, you can see the Sitco sign, which is one mile to go but you still have to contain your energy and hold yourself back just a little bit. Kenmore Square, get ready for some serious cheering. Traditionally, about 35,000 Red Sox fans gather after their morning Patriots Day game to power the Boston Marathon runners through their last mile. There's this wave of energy. The crowds are going absolutely ballistic. Kenmore Square is when you can really, really 
really turn on the excitement because you are in at that point. little hill underneath the Tommy Leonard Bridge at Mass Avenue can really take the starch out of your legs as you're running for home. The worst is almost over. You take a right hand turn onto Hereford Street and run up what is affectionately known as Mount Hereford. You make a left onto Boylston Street and 600 meters to go to the finish. And everything's poured out in that last stretch on Boylston Street. And when I finally get there, I just let out all my celebration. This is graduating from college, getting your master's, your MBA, your PhD, getting the big contract, <laughs> getting all the, it's Christmas, Halloween, it's all the good things, everything coming together. As I'm crossing the finish line, I'm realizing this isn't just about me, it's about all those people who supported me. When you cross that finish line, it's one of those rare times in life when dreams and reality become one. You understand that runners have run this race since 1896, and you've run in their footsteps. And a century from now, people will run in your footsteps.